Welcome to Wineline Radio and Wineline TV. This is your host, Robert Scott. Uh, following this introduction is a very interesting wine seminar that I think you'll find uh, illuminating. It's about the wines of Santa Barbara County, California. Sand, vines, people, and wines. In attendance were uh, winemakers from Brewer, Clifton, Hartford, Byron, Kendall, Jackson, Cambria, Nielsen, Diatom, and Sidore. I think you'll find this uh, following uh, seminar extremely interesting and informative. So enjoy. He was growing grapes in the valley, and his wife, uh, his sister slash best friend, moved to Morro Bay on the coast, and the wife said, we need to move closer. So like any good husband, he was like, yes, ma'am. Um, and, and then really sought out where to be planting grapes, and he centered in on uh, the Tepesque, the bench. You really hear a lot about the bench uh, today. But it was Tepesque Vineyards originally, uh, and he planted where uh, Byron and Cambria now are located. So uh, again, people said, oh no, it's way too cold to be growing wine grapes there. And he's growing Merlot, Cap Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, which it, it is too cold to be growing those. But there was a 14 acre of Onroot and Chardonnay that when I started at Byron in 2001, we were still making Chardonnay off of. And that was really the block that was the aha moment as people were uh, processing the grapes of, wow, this could be a really good region for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So definitely a pioneer. Um, uh, there are quite a few pioneers in, in Santa Barbara County, but it's just that spirit, I think, kind of goes through from Uriel Nielsen to some of the, you know, Ken Brown and Richard Sanford, and, and we, I think us as winemakers, we try to carry that torch, and it's been a fun ride. Absolutely. And of course, you know, in 71, Richard Sanford plants his vineyard, and we know that that's a historical moment as well. Uh, and then, you know, there was a period, uh, who of you guys remember, you know, Jim Clendenin from Mobile Clemont, right? Bob Lindquist from, from Cupe, uh, Lane Tanner, uh, all these guys. There was a real sort of explosion of interest. <coughs> you must, I mean, you're friends with a lot of these people, you guys. They, but I heard it was a wild time also. Wild West. It's beautiful. If you think about any kind of innovating, pioneering spirit, you know, so certainly, I mean, if Jackson Company is built on that, that's clean. You know, that, kind of, that, that vision, that risk, that commitment, um, sticking your neck out. And, and you know, none of us you know, that are, have called Single Our Home could really be, none of this would be possible if not for those. You know, that they did the hard part. It's like a relay race, right? Why is it a long trajectory? And you know, it's like a race. You know, that, that's critical, critical 400 meters. Um, it was, that was you know, beautifully by the individual. Well, and also with a lot of character and a lot of chutzpah, right? So Santa Barbara's not like Sonoma, not like Napa, not like Oregon or Burgundy. It's a totally individuated place with very individuated characters. And so these guys kind of set the stage for how people would behave moving forward. They share a lot of ideas. Right? There's a famous picture of Lane Tanner in a picking bin hot tub with a bunch of guys. I mean, <laughs> Santa Barbara is not like anywhere else. Uh, and so, but the other thing that happened, of course, <coughs> happened in 1986. And Chris and Randy, you guys have some real thoughts about this. Go for it there, Chris. <laughs> sure. I think, uh, I think, you know, I'll let Randy handle the, uh, the specificity of the winemaking a little bit more. But Greg talked about it beautifully, I think, and that's the pioneering spirit. Um, and that, I think, is what my family's legacy was built upon. Uh, you know, it sounds passe now, but back in 1982, when we started the idea of a California Chardonnay at a premium price point that was barrel fermented and 100% expression of that variety, uh, my father had to talk to 30 different distributors before he got one on board. So it was not, you know, passe back then. It was a novel concept. And likewise, he had that entrepreneurial spirit, that bet while going into, uh, into tapestry in the Santa Maria. 
Russian River had a tremendous amount of notoriety. Uh, Lake County, obviously, with the success there, was a crucial part of what he was doing. But he decided that he wanted to focus upon Santa Barbara for Chardonnay production because he thought that that, as a component piece of a holistic blend, would give his wine a little bit more complexity, a little bit more tropical of a tone, a little bit more plush of a mid -tone. So he made that risk and he made that acquisition of that estate, you know, hoping that it was the right decision for wine quality. And uh, I think if he had not made that acquisition, if he had not had that pioneering vision uh, from the outside looking in to Santa Barbara, we wouldn't be where we are today. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because when this whole thing came down, you know, Jess was in his 50s, he was an attorney in San Francisco and had a vineyard up in Lake County, had been selling his grapes, that's where he was going for to to enjoy the warmth of the summer because in San Francisco, you know what they say, the coldest, none of that go the coldest. The gold I respect was the summer in San Francisco. Yeah. Mark, yeah. Mark, Mark, Mark Twain. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, so he, he, he wanted to get out there and get some sunshine and warmth, so they went up in, uh, up to Lake County, had a little vineyard, planted some more grapes, were selling their grapes, and became a gentleman farmer. And then one year, there's, you know, we have these cycles, and we had a grape club. And uh, the fencers who Jess had been selling the grapes to said, you know, sorry, Charlie, sorry, Jess, we can't buy any of your grapes. So he decided to start you know, making some wine and realized that he could do that. Plus, he was incredibly smart. And he realized, well, gee, if there's extra grapes here, there must be more up and down the coast. He studied a little bit about winemaking and Burgundian winemaking and realized there's you can do a you know, very specific vineyard designated type of a, of a wine, or you can blend a little bit. And he took advantage of the surplus and decided to work on a, a, a to make a wine that the people could drink and enjoy, which involved the North Coast and then the Central Coast being Monterey had the run and lime tones. It is a belt curve of flavors. And then also the Santa Barbara had this wonderful <coughs> a tropical tone. And again, it's a bell curve of flavors, uh, well, what he called flavor domains. And he was a land attorney, and so he realized that, it, and he liked to be in control of everything. And so he decided, well, we're really going to do this right. We're going to buy the land in all these spots and, and focus on the farming and getting the grapes right to ultimately make wonderful wine. So Santa Barbara, from going from the North Coast, was the first foray into everything. And again, people thought it was a bit, of, a bit nuts because it was so cool and kind of unproven, even though the flavor domain was there for the tropical tone. And then the rest is history. Yep. And you know, the, uh, this sideways thing, I mean, that really can't be underestimated. Jill, what did sideways effectively do to two different grapes? So, <laughs> killed your low. Walking in, inspired me to get into wine. Um, it killed Merlot. Um, killed Merlot. Uh, Remember, sideways killed Merlot. That is weird, right? Okay. And really put uh, Pinot Noir on the map for people, especially Santa Barbara. Yep. Completely. Do you guys remember that phenomenon? Yeah. Remember like the 60 Minutes phenomenon also when they said that you know red wine was good for the heart? It's shocking how much power the media has. But really, no one had paid any attention to Santa Barbara up until then. So it was kind of a, a, a seminal moment. And then I think this is important too. We, we've talked a bit about this, but I, I want you to leave with a sense of what this means. That the, the, the old guard, as we call them, the old farts and the upstarts, right? The new, the new kids like on the block. Right here, guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Ryan, you, you speak to this all the time. There's a, a kind of a bristling world of experimentation going on. Yeah, so it's, it's really cool. I mean, Santa Barbara County, as we just saw, the first vineyard was only planted in 64, so pretty young, really, in, in the world of wine. Hasn't actually been around that long, and you'll see in a couple slides that there's a few appellations that um, have kind of just been created in the last five or ten years. So, very young region, but it's it's also really cool that we do still have the old guard available to us. Um, you know, we can we can call Richard Sanford or Ken Brown or Jim Clendenin and, and meet them for lunch and, and talk about history and, and you know what we can change and move forward. So, a lot of opportunity for growth and a lot of different. Um, so much opportunity in Santa Barbara. And stylistic diversity. So that's another big part of what we want you to take away from this session. 
is the range. So let's go ahead and nose those peanuts and, and start tasting them while we continue to talk because they're going to change dramatically. And I want you to start thinking about what you're finding in the glass and, and how it may be different from, from other regions, right? Because there is something in these glasses that is saying Santa Barbara. And, and hopefully by the time you, you guys head out, you will have a strong sense of what it means. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a minute to kind of consider also like the, the press angle for Santa Barbara, we don't really think that anybody has covered it to the level that we'd like to see. I just right? We, mm -hmm. they, they know that there's a, a sideways range. We know so that there's these various aspects. But so people are only just now starting to pick up on what makes it special. Question back here? Why are we tasting Pinot Noir? Why are we tasting Pinot Noir before Chardonnay? <laughs> Outstanding question. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, give this one to Chris. Well, you know, I think it's the, uh, the precision of the Chardonnay that you get from Santa Barbara. It's that minerality, it's that acidity, it's that body. I will explain climactically why that is the case, but these wines have the ability, have the ability to hold up after a Pinot Noir. And not only a Pinot Noir, but I mean, you'd be flabbergasted. You can taste the Petit Syrah, you can taste the Zimbabwe. They add that precision. And it's almost like sorbet after, you know, a main course, right? That little bit of acidity, that little bit of a, a purity of flavor cuts through the palate. So we have no problem with these uh, Santa Barbara Chardonnay's tasting right after red. And uh, likewise, my recommendation would be if somebody wants to experiment with a white wine after a heavy-handed, you know, red wine in one of your establishments, this is the type of thing that can hold out to those tannins and that alcohol that Years ago, I was tasting with Robert Parker. I'd been tasting with him for a few years. We always did whites and then reds. And I sat down with him to taste, and I was pouring, getting ready to pour him the whites. And he's like, no, 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 I always do reds before whites. I'm like, the fuck you do? You haven't done that for like five years. And then you've done that before. Um, but he explained to me that at the time, it left him after tasting a bunch of wines, it left him feeling um, more refreshed. Mm -hmm at the end of the tasting to do reds before white. So, and I think particularly in areas with really good acidity, like in areas in Santa Barbara, um, I actually think it's a pretty good way. Uh, and then, of course, you have to taste tequila before you do the reds and the white. Naturally. Naturally. Well, For if you're in Boston, it's Guinness. Right. One more thing, and I think it's kind of an uh, important point. Sorry, I know there's a question over there, but experientially, have you ever heard the phrase salt and cheese uh, uh, buying bread? Right? Like, you want to be able to experience something that is not hiding some negative attribute to it. So I think that with these wines at room temperature, with the crackers in front of you in this type of setting, there's no, there's no illusions, it's just what's in the glass, right? And that's a pretty interesting experience and a pretty pure experience for having the expression of the wine. Yeah. We, we, we actually used to do a lot of tastings with Parker, too. Uh, with, usually we would do it um, by tier. So we start with Vintners Reserve and then go to Grand Reserve in the Jackson Estate. So it's, you know, you know white, Pinot, Cab, Power Cab. And then repeat that, and repeat that, and repeat that. And so we'd come off of our, our um, Veter Peak Cab, which is like a kick ass cab. Powerful, and then drop right back into a Chardonnay, a stature Chardonnay, which is basically very close to our Camelot Chardonnay. People go, What in the hell are you doing? So you just wait till you try this. And it's like mind blowing. So yeah. it'll work, trust me. <laughs> yeah, in wine competitions, it's really interesting. you often will taste Sauvignon Blanc after red because your palate gets cheap. So I, I don't. We beat that subject to death. <laughs> 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 All right, good. Uh, so, so then uh, let's go ahead and get into a little bit of the terroir, and then we're going to get into specific wines. So this is what I mean about, about Santa Barbara. And of course, this is all in your booklet. And we, the reason that we created that booklet is so that you could, at any time, be like, well, what are the, what are the ABs? What are the characteristics of, of Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir from the region, et cetera, et cetera? We wanted to be studied and accurate about this for you. We felt a very strong obligation to make sure that that was correct. Six AVAs, 
right? As you can see. But guys, if you think about all of these regions as you go west to east, things change dramatically. Greg. Yeah, you know, I, I think one is complicated, and, and, and today, you know, we have the luxury of having pretty people who are in the all of the things. You know, also being mindful that, you know, we rarely have that kind of time luxury, right? Especially these days, phones, quick, 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 attention span, time at the table, a buyer who's a fancy, who's got a bus or who's sick that day, whatever. You have to hit pretty hard, hit very specifically, and I think the core, like common denominator that, that anchors Santa Barbara is the ocean. And in the Pacific where we are, we're super cold, and I, I've been thinking a lot about Florida, and I know that you all have a lot of diverse oceanic influence. And each one is very different, yeah? from the west coast to the east coast, north or south. And it can probably be deceiving. There might be pockets where it's like warm and balmy and tropical and vibey, and, and parts that might be more stark and like oceanic, you know, like finally and like <coughs> In um, the Pacific where we are, it's really cold. We have different species of animal on that point where it says Santa than we do down in Santa Barbara, right? Which is like a half hour east, ironically, but you know, facing south. Where it's warmer and a little more resort like. That's savage. Uh, I mean, it's cold and brutal. No one goes to the beach in Lombard where we were. It's, it's, it's different. It's really cold. Um, and so that, that, that marine thing pulsing through our whole area informs our wines and dictates our wines. And there's a salinity and an oceanic tendency woven through everything that happens in our county. Um, and I would encourage you just to be kind of thinking about you know, the ocean is, is, it can be very serene and calming, and it's also very, it's, it's, it's a force. Yeah. yeah. And I think the wines demonstrate that a little bit as well. And as you, and of course, the fact that you will see Sauvignon Blanc, which is a typically, unless it's made on the war style, a warm climate grape, Right? You'll see Cabernet, you'll see Rhone varieties, which can go in either direction in terms of climate, all over the state. And so what we really want to focus on is that, the east-west valleys that are closest to the water. Right? This map is, is, is really, um, it really illustrates what's going on because, it, of course, it's going to warm up as you get inland. But what I also want to make sure that you understand is why that happened. So Adam, you really have been enjoying this slide. This is very, very unusual. So Adam, <laughs> tell us about this geological collision. Yeah, so this is a large part of what I think makes Santa Barbara, I mean, we're going to touch on a few different things that make Santa Barbara really special, but there was a collision of flights that occurred 25,000 years ago that twisted California basically sideways. And if you look at a map, if you look at the third picture there, you will see this turn that exists in California geography. And that has turned the valleys that we're talking about, Santa Maria, um, Los Alamos, which we'll touch on in a little bit, and Santa Rita Hills, to east-west valleys. That's incredibly <coughs> unusual. If you think about it, many of you, I'm sure, have been to Napa Valley, runs north-south. Um, Sonoma Valley, most of the things in Sonoma County running north-south. Uh, even Anderson Valley and Santa Lucia Highlands run northwest to southeast. Um, in fact, there are no other valleys on the west coast of North America <coughs> that run directly east-west. This is the only place that does that. And the largest area of valleys that run um, east-west on the, the west coast of all the Americas. It just doesn't happen much. And that opens um, it up directly to the Pacific. Greg mentioning the ocean earlier, that's key, that's really key, but it's key that the ocean is there and it's key that there's access to the ocean, those two things. And that allows for the fog and the wind to come in. I grew up in Texas and in Texas, basically the further south you were, the warmer you were. It was just kind of a given. You, you could sit there and you could see fronts coming down um, through Chicago, Missouri, and you could see, oh, okay, this is a big one. It's gonna get really cold, but it, its effect generally lessened the further south it got to some extent. It was warmer. Santa Barbara grape growing has a little bit of a, a disadvantage in some ways because we all think about Santa Barbara, the city and the beaches and the you know and how palm trees and that kind of stuff. We don't think that this area in quote unquote Southern California, really central, but Southern California is cooler, far cooler than six hours north in Napa Valley, but it is. 
because of that east-west valley. It's really, really unique um, and very special. Yeah, there's no other wine region in the world that's an east-west valley. I mean, there are little tributaries here and there, right? Certainly the Loire, but it's not a valley that's completely a, a, like a vacuum convection oven, like <laughs> sucking the cold air in, okay? So um, that's the one thing, one of the th key things we want to take away in terms of uh, climate, right? You can see that, again, you've got all of the specific influence just pulling in to, to the area. Some of the vineyards are only six, seven miles away from the ocean. And for any of you who've ever come to California to swim in the ocean, you know, of course, that you're like sadly, sadly misguided, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we call them the sideways sirens. And that's really how we, 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 we want to convey this, is um, Greg came up with this, and it's killer. Um, the siren is a, you know, is a, uh, a, a mythical uh, mermaid, right, that hauled sailors in to, to their death on the shore. Now, <laughs> right? Yeah, right? And, and they're attractive. Yeah. That was my favorite. That's right. That's right. Uh, not and encouraging course, for all of us making wine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is it. Crashing onto the rocks. Yeah. Um, so we you, have. So you, yeah, exactly. So you got Santa Maria, which is an ABA, and then you have Los Alamos in between, which will be an ABA, no question about it, and then, of course, Santa Rita. So these three sirens. Uh, and that's kind of what we, we want people to walk away with, is, is that that is where our focus is. Now, Let's talk about the next most critical element, which is soil. And so, Brian, I know that you spent a lot of time thinking about rocks. <laughs> and, you, know, you know, if we were to talk about the soils and, and how they, they work for you, I mean, you've made one all over the world. How are these soils different? Yeah, so just like our climate is you know, heavily influenced by the ocean, so are the soils. Um, Marine derived soils in, in all three of these valleys. It's a lot of uh, sandy loam in, in San Maria Valley. And then, um, you know, similar soils in Los Alamos. And Santa Rita Hills has a little bit more uh, extreme aspects and hillsides um, and a couple different types of limestone and diatomaceous earth soils. Um, and Santa Rita Hills is kind of unique because there's sort of two sides to the Appalachian. There's one road called Santa Rosa Road, which is a winding road through the steeper hills with a lot of diatomaceous earth, um, basically fossilized um, sea creatures. And then on the other side, there's more sandy loam and a little bit of clay loam, and kind of on the bottom of the valley is basically like a sandbox. So a big variety of soils, all well-draining, um, you know, nutrient-deprived soils. But all from one source? Yeah. Yeah, all from the ocean. Anyone in the room want to wager, like, where else you find this, like, consistency of soils all from the ocean? Mm. Yeah. There isn't anywhere else. Okay. <laughs> so that's the, I mean, Jerez, maybe, right? There are some, some, some regions, some smaller regions, Spain. Burgundy definitely has a lot of marine soil derivation. Okay? But it's not strictly marine. So there is there is, a, it is a, a very interesting thing going on here, and we feel very strongly that they influence the wines. In this first uh, round of wines, are you picking up something other than just fruit? There's a lot going on. It's not just about fruit. And these are young wines, and normally in young Pinot Noirs, you do find you know, quite a bit of fruit berries, right, other things like that. Um, there's more going on, such as what? Salinity. Salinity. What else? Minerality. Minerality. Eucalyptus. Resinous quality. What else? Earth. Yeah, definitely. And that's a big part of, of what's going on here. So if I were to ask straight down the line, what, what, what single word you'd give to, to Santa Barbara Pino, what would it be, Chris? Savory. Savory. Spice. Mm. I'll go with tannins. Earth. Earth. Sweet. Sweet. Forest floor. Forest floor. Subwa. Fleshiness. Fleshy. Savory. And I'm going to go with savory, too. That's, that keeps coming up for me. 
right? And we're going to get into a discussion of, about umami. As well, because we think umami. That's an important element mm -hmm. to consider. That's exactly How what I was going to say. The umami factors. Right. It's not the thing. All right. Um, let's come back to that. What I want to do is get right to the lines. Okay? And also, um, so we're going to go through these. We're going to have the winemakers talk about each of the wines. Feel free to ask any questions. And then we're going to start nosing and getting into the Chardonnay and talk a little bit about terroir. Uh, so let's talk about the Nielsen. Yeah, so the 2016 <coughs> Santa Barbara County, this wine's coming from all three of those sideways sirens that we just talked about, um, which is a fun wine to make because it is kind of representing the whole of Santa Barbara County Pinot Noir. Um, it's about 55% from Santa Maria Valley, which tends to impart a lot of that red fruit and earth and spice, and then about 30% from Santa Rita Hills, which is more of the powerful tannin. Um, and darker fruits, and then the last little bit from Los Alamos, uh, which tends to also bring in some dark fruit notes. Um, and it's pretty much all neutral oak, tiny bit of new oak in there. Um, and that's just to kind of express the whole whole region of Pinot Noir and uh, the, the fruit characters that we get. Yeah. Nice. Under screw cap? Screw cap, yep. Okay, I love that. Um, crazy value. Crazy value. If you think about um, complexity, and again, where you're going to get those savory characters, we know this: Borgonia, Otago, parts of the coast, Oregon, <coughs> etc. They don't retail for this. Santa Barbara is still relatively under the radar in terms of pricing, so now would be the time to act before it gets crazy. It's going to. There's no question about it. It's already starting to happen. So this kind of wine is, is, is super exciting. When I was a buyer, I'd be like, yes, please, how much can I take? Uh, let's get to this next wine, Sidori 17. Uh, and what's cool is that this is really one of your first forays into making a full Santa Barbara wine, right? It is. It's the first time. I, I've been making Santa Barbara Pinot Noir, Santa Rita Hills, specifically Pinot Noir, since 2000. Um, as Gil mentioned, I make Pinot from Oregon all the way down. I'm, I'm Oregon, the Anderson Valley, Russian River, Sonoma Coast, Sonoma Mountains, San Lucia Islands. Uh, I was making all of those when an opportunity came to me to get fruit from the Santa Rita Hills. Uh, it was the 2000 vintage. I actually went down there in 99. Tried to convince my wife that more time on the road was a good idea to go to vineyards. She didn't quite agree with that, but um, we did it anyhow, even though Santa Barbara has been a large part of Sidiri even before we started making wine. Diane and I got engaged in Santa Barbara at a place called the Wine Cast um, before we started making wine. Uh, on our honeymoon, we ran away for a couple of days to a wine futures tasting in Santa Barbara. So that's how into the area we had been. So I knew she was going to say it was a good idea to go down there. She didn't, but we did it anyhow. She ultimately <laughs> thought it was. But I never had the opportunity to really work with Santa Maria fruit as well. And so then with, uh, Santa Maria for me was the one place between the Tascadero and the town of Santa Barbara that you can find an adult video news store. So that was the one uh, advantage there. Um, it's true, actually. You can look it up. It's called Diamond Adult Video World. But whatever. Uh, uh, that was its main calling card. But now the grapes are the calling card as well. So what I'm trying to do with this is blend together the best characteristics of Santa Maria fruit, which tend to be a little more red-fruited, along with some of the darker characteristics of Santa Rita, and make something more interesting, more complex. There's also a freedom that existed with this particular wine for me that I didn't have before. Like it or not, when you've been owning a winery, making a wine um, like Siduri for a long time, you find yourself, even when you own the winery, kind of in a box that people expect this from Siduri at a certain point in time. It's been around a long time. Uh, here, starting out with a brand new wine gave me the freedom to try some different things that I hadn't done before. So in this particular case, I did a larger percentage of whole cluster on this wine than I had traditionally done on any of the other stuff, thinking it would make it very interesting, very different than the other things that I did. Um, it's also an opportunity to make something I think that's also a very, very good value, as in Ryan's wine, 
that that gives the people an opportunity to have an entryway into um, the area, and then with some of the single vineyards, they can try things that are a little either heavier or more complex or more uniquely differentiated by the particular site. So that's kind of how this all came about. And 2017 is the very, very first vintage of a Siduri Santa Barbara County Appalachian Pinot Noir.